Welcome to Stars and Swords. I'm Alistair Stevens. This week, we begin our third series with part one of V.E. Schwab's 2020 novel, The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue. And if you're new to Stars and Swords, here's what you need to know. Here's what we're going to do. I am going to delve into this week's reading to talk about the story and the craft and the technique and the poetry of the prose in order to get a better appreciation, a better understanding of how this book does what it does. We're going to stick to the reading, which means spoilers for part one of the book, but no later parts. And that is going to be tricky because this is a book that loves a late reveal. Before we get to that, though, a brief introduction to our author. Victoria Schwab, who writes under that name for YA audiences and under V.E. Schwab for adults, is a publishing phenomenon. It is impossible to talk about the landscape of popular fantasy publishing over the last 10 years without talking about her work, and it is a remarkably prolific body of work at that, beginning with The Near Witch in 2011 and ending, as of this recording, with The Fragile Threads of Power in 2023. That's 19 novels in 12 years, plus various short stories and graphic novels and writing on a TV adaptation of her vampire short story First Kill, it is an enviable body of work by any metric, and all the more so when you consider how quickly she has put it together. The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue was published by Tor on October 6th, 2020, and it was immediately a huge success. It's fueled by a wave of popularity on social media, particularly on TikTok. And of course, as there is to all things, there was a little backlash, because the world is still the world, and Schwab is a queer woman writing in subgenres traditionally more popular with female readers. But as the dust settles, and the first wave of enthusiasm naturally fades, we're beginning to get a clearer idea about this book. We're beginning to be able to look at it objectively, and I'm so glad to say that it is a genuinely brilliant piece of work. It combines a well-crafted and audacious plot with some of the most sensitive and immediate and romantic prose that I have read in a good long while. So we are going to discuss the whole thing over the next six weeks, taking one week per part of the novel, and then combining parts six, which is effectively the finale, with part seven, which is effectively the epilogue, into one extra-length final episode. If you have thoughts or questions or comments as we proceed, then please get in touch. You can email starsandswordspod at gmail.com, or you can find me at Stars and Swords Pod on Instagram, and as of this morning, Blue Sky. What an exciting new world we live in. Two quick and connected pieces of business before we get started. In addition to praise for Schwab, I want to acknowledge the excellent cover design work by Will Staley, who is a great follow on Instagram if you're inclined to do such a thing, and is responsible for some of the best cover designs of the last seven or eight years. Just a ton of really strong work. And on a similar note, I want to offer huge praise for the work of Julia Whalen, for my money, the best audiobook narrator currently working, who delivers probably her best work in the audio version of Addie LaRue. It's a hell of an accomplishment. And even if you're not an audiobook person, I would recommend checking it out. When I'm prepping for this show, I always have the physical, digital, and audio versions of the book in rotation at the same time, because I need to be so deep in the text, but I can't always be holding the physical copy. And Waylon, who had set the previous bar for best audiobook performance with her work on Gillian Flynn's Gone Girl, consistently finds the complexity and the warmth and the urgency of the prose. So this isn't an ad or anything, but highly recommended. Okay, let's talk about the book. And in this case, we need to begin with a brief discursion into genre, because by understanding what kind of book this is, we're going to be able to draw upon different tools and techniques, different interpretive modes in order to understand it. And I know, the resistance to this kind of categorization, the discussion of genre is too often reductive, it's too often restrictive, and it's almost always pedantic. But genre also carries with it associations and expectations, priorities within the text, a web of intertextual connections with similar and dissimilar texts. Genre is a place to stand in our apprehension of this book. On Goodreads, The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue is primarily filed under fantasy, fiction, romance, historical fiction, adult, historical, magical realism, LGBT, contemporary, and paranormal. And some of those are clearly applicable here. None of those are even incorrect, 
But none of them, with the exception of fiction, which is undeniable, apart from fiction, none of them are really accurate descriptions of what this book is, of what this book does. It's kind of a fantasy novel, but it doesn't delve into the kind of extended world building and rule making that we expect from modern fantasy. It's kind of historical fiction, but it has little to say about capital H history or the ways in which that history touches and influences the characters. It's kind of magical realist, but the default conceptualization of the world underneath the fantastical elements isn't as grounded and prosaic as we usually expect from magical realism. We are not here playing with that distinction between the magical and the mundane. Yes, it is an LGBTQ text, but part of what makes it so successful as a queer text is how casual it is in its treatment of queer identity, particularly male bisexuality. It is a romance, yes, but the romance at its most successful, is oriented around one character, Addie, and her experience. And when the romance is oriented around other characters, it is, I think, somewhat less successful. And, no spoilers, but the end of the book further complicates our understanding of what the book is, of what the book does. And this is where some readers will naturally throw up their hands and say, well, fine, then, it's just fiction, or if they like it enough, if they consider it good, whatever that means, then perhaps literary fiction, and they'll move on. And I understand that impulse. But we are made of sterner stuff. And when we consider this book part fantasy, part romance, part history, tinged with the gothic and tinged with a didactic desire to present a philosophy on how a life is lived well, when we consider what the book pays attention to and what it lets go without comment, when we think about the emphasis that is put on rules and meanings and just as much the emphasis that is not put on rules and meanings, when we think about the magnitude and the grandeur and the powerful use of symbols, of icons, of underlying metaphor, then we maybe approach a conclusion. Because, to me, the invisible life of Addie LaRue is best understood, and I believe is intended as, a fairy tale. I don't attach to that thought, to that categorization, any negative association at all, or imply any doubt as to the book's significance or value. This is a technical understanding, and if we do look at The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue as a fairy tale, we benefit from certain analytical perspectives and techniques that wouldn't fit so well if we're looking at it as a simple romance or a simple fantasy. And what's more, once you're open to the possibility of reading this book as a fairy tale, the book itself confirms that reading in a handful of ways, even in this first part. More on that as we progress. So as we read Addie LaRue, we're going to try to encompass all that there is within this book. That's why we're taking six weeks, which is a leisurely schedule. Although I was thinking about this right before I started recording, and this is a little speculative, but if time opens up and since parts four and five of the novel slow the pace just a little bit, if I can... I'll combine them into one longer episode because, and yes, this isn't perhaps the most important thing, but what does Addie teach us if not to recognize the special significance of the insignificant detail? If I can combine parts four and five into a single episode, we'll finish the series on March 10th, which is Addie's birthday. And that seems poetic. So if you have thoughts, get in touch and let me know. I'll decide by next week. And if we're aiming for five episodes instead of six, I will let you know. Don't worry, we won't skimp on our analysis. I'll just work a little harder, and produce a slightly longer show. But as I was saying, my intention with this podcast is to thoroughly explore the novel. But within that exploration, we are going to be particularly focused on certain elements, on the characterization of Addie and her supporting cast, on the narrative voice, on what this book is, this actual account, these written words, what this book is on the philosophies of life and art and love that are represented, and on the peculiarly feminine experience of an unusually vivid and independent heroine. With all that said, then, let's get to the text, though not yet the story, because this book makes, in its opening pages, a powerful narrative move. Prefatory material in fiction usually serves one of three purposes, to establish tone, to foreshadow action, and to establish an implied structure. Luckily, The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue gives us all three in quick succession. The epigraph, the cold open, and the first of our curatorial interstitials. Let's begin with the epigraph. Quote, The old gods may be great, but they are neither kind nor merciful. They are fickle, unsteady as moonlight on water or shadows in a storm. If you insist on calling them, take heed. 
Be careful what you ask for. Be willing to pay the price. And no matter how desperate or dire, never pray to the gods that answer after dark. Estelle Magritte, 1642 to 1719. This quotation is taken from chapter four of the first part of the book, and we'll talk about it a little more when we get there. But for now, let's look at it as a true epigraph, as a true introduction of theme. There are, we are told, old gods. They are neither kind nor merciful. They are fickle. And look here at the description of that fickleness, like moonlight on water or shadows in a storm. The moonlight itself is constant, but the unpredictability of the reflection is caused by the surface of the water. Just as the shadows are cast by the lightning of the storm, the fickleness is itself inconstant, is itself a consequence of some other light, which might tell us perhaps that the old gods are not malevolent, not scheming, not corruptive, but much wilder. And if you wanted confirmation that we're supposed to apprehend this book as a fairy tale, this could be it. So the old gods are dangerous, and even if you do call them, be careful what you ask and be willing to pay the price, though by implication, because they are fickle, there's no real way of knowing what the price will be, which suggests that we should call only in the most urgent exigency. And then the pivot, of course, the turn. The old gods are dangerous and will mess with you and will demand a price, and those are the good ones. Those are the safe ones. The ones that answer after dark are too dangerous to even consider. The theme is set. We are not, in this book, navigating between safety and danger. We're navigating between the manageable risk and the unmanageable. The other thing to consider is the accreditation given to Estelle, who we're about to meet in the story itself. Quoting and crediting Estelle here confers a kind of authority to her, which is going to be put to excellent effect when we get back to this quote in chapter 4. The second piece of prefatory material is the cold open on the girl running for her life in villon sous sartre in 1714. This piece serves two purposes. The first, like the epigraph, is to establish a theme. This girl, who we know by name only because it is called out after her, runs from the life behind her, static as a drawing, solid as a tomb. We also introduce this mysterious girl's freckles, perhaps the most important symbol in a book full of symbols. Seven freckles arrayed across her cheeks. Quote, Seven freckles, one for every love she'd have. That's what Estelle had said when the girl was still young. One for every life she'd lead, one for every god watching over her. End quote. Prophecy, destiny, the looking forward into time and opportunity, contrasted with the fixed, unchanging present, embodied in the motion of the girl, the run across the meadow, literally the running from the present to the future. So on one hand, yes, confirmation of theme and by the reference to Estelle here, further confirmation of her authority, but also drama, immediacy, action. This is the technique deployed by network TV shows who will show you some dramatic scene before the opening credits and the ad break in order to hook you. A moment of excitement that will linger in the imagination even when we flash back to establish how this action came to occur. And this isn't just a hook for the reader, though it is a hook for the reader. It's also demonstrating how the book will play with time. The narrative is presented in third-person present tense, which is, we should note, historically unusual, but very fashionable in the last 20 years or so, accompanying the rise of young adult and new adult fiction, and a movement in literary fiction which demands greater immediacy than the staid and traditional third-person past tense perspective can offer. In 2010, in an article for the Guardian newspaper in Britain, author Philip Pullman bemoaned the rise of present tense third person because the limited perspective felt to him too claustrophobic, too intimate. Quote, I want all the young present tense storytellers, the old ones have won prizes and are incorrigible, to allow themselves to stand back and show me a wider temporal perspective. I want them to feel able to say what happened, what usually happened, what sometimes happened, what had happened before something else happened, what might happen later, what actually did happen, and so on, to use the full range of English tenses. End quote. And I mention this partly because... Anything that annoys Philip Pullman is to be celebrated, and partly to demonstrate how incomplete and narrow this understanding is. Because the invisible life of Addie LaRue rejects absolutely the notion that third-person present perspective is limited. It is, as we see even in this brief excerpt, effortlessly varied, moving in exactly the way the human mind moves from the present to the past to the future, from the speculative to the real, from the imaginary to the physical. And 
to be clear, this is a quality of the perspective in abstract, but it isn't a magical tool that can be wielded by just anyone. Its wildly successful use in this book is a testament to both the skill and the courage of the author, and we are going to spend, I think, a lot of time looking at how exactly it works its magic on the page, and where, perhaps, it is put to a slightly more dubious use. The third piece of prefatory material comes after the title page for the first part of the book. It is enfolded in the delineated structure of the novel, and will be, minor spoilers, echoed by other examples of the same form at the beginning of the other parts of the book. It is structural. We don't have enough information to understand why we're being told about this piece of art, these five wooden birds mounted on a marble plinth, about to take flight but fixed in place, but even here we can feel the echo of the girl running in the meadow, trying to escape something which seems inescapable. So even before we know what the real meaning is, we can perhaps sense a continuity of perspective. Also, when we get to the end of the book, we are going to return to this first interstitial and wonder about its inclusion. More on that in many weeks' time, I guess. So this is a lot. Three rounds of prefatory material, three sets of themes and perspectives overlapping but disparate, irreducible. We're already swimming in this book before we get to the first word of the story itself. Which makes that first line, of course, all the more important. Quote, the girl wakes up in someone else's bed. End quote. The caption at the top of the page tells us that we are in New York, 300 years after the glimpse of the girl in the meadow, but the repetition of both the girl and the formal structure of the sentence connects the two immediately, even without a knowledge of what this book is about, even if we can imagine a hypothetical person who picks up this book or hits play on the audiobook without glancing at the glowing compliments on the back of the dust jacket or reading the one-line precy in their audiobook app, both of which make it clear what we're to take from this opening, even that person, blissful in their ignorance, will immediately understand, or at least suspect, what is happening here. And this skill with repetition is one of the most formidable weapons, or perhaps to switch metaphors, tools in Schwab's armory or toolbox, depending on which road we are taking, half-repeated thoughts that are split and splintered across sentence fragments give us the sense of a scattered mind. Quote, she knows, of course, that she can't, knows he'll forget, they always do, it isn't his fault, it is never their faults, end quote. This is the most important technique that the book has to move us in and out of Addie's head, or more accurately, I suppose, closer to and further away from Addie's perspective, because despite what Philip Pullman asserts, this is not a claustrophobic book, because it is capable of shifting from the intensely intimate and subjective and experiential and sensual to the distant, omniscient, displaced perspective of the disembodied narrator. And as I mentioned earlier, we should always be mindful of this narrative voice, because at the end of the book, we're going to have some very big thoughts on what the narrative voice is, what it's doing, and where it comes from. We're introduced not to the mechanics of the character's situation here, but to how some of those mechanics make her feel. She lies about her name because she can't speak her real name, but it's more than that. A rose by any other name may smell as sweet, but it isn't exactly the same flower. Quote, In the last month she has been Claire, Zoe, Michelle, but two nights ago when she was Al and they were closing down a late night cafe after one of his gigs, Toby said that he was in love with a girl named Jess. He simply hadn't met her yet. So now she is Jess, end quote. Two nights ago when she was Al, now she is Jess. Not is called, not goes by, not pretends to be, but is. And it's not just the name, it's something more substantial. There is a quality of being which is attached to that name, even if we don't know to what degree the character is changing herself according to the name she adopts for the evening. Names are definitive in some sense, and this is important, of course, because to take a step back from this scene and consider the book as a whole, Addie's tragedy is magnified by the loss of her name. Even here on the first page, we are brought to the understanding that names matter. This will be true throughout the novel, though the immediate import of names and naming will often pass without comment, but we, I promise, will be watching. We're introduced here to the reality of Addie's life, then, her inability to make a mark, to speak her own name, to be remembered. We're also introduced to her fleeting connection with others, with her love of art and memory and history and poetry, to the presence of the silken voice of the darkness that is always with her, either literally so or present in memory, 
And also, of course, to the way that Addie sows the seeds of art in the minds and imaginations of others, how she plays the muse. We'll circle back to all of those elements later in today's reading. Addie parts from Toby, and we are told that she will be forgotten, and in chapter two, we open with a reflection on the passage of time and the changing of the seasons. Quote, March is such a fickle month. It is the seam between winter and spring, though seam suggests an even hem, and March is more like a rough line of stitches sewn by an unsteady hand, swinging wildly between January gusts and June greens. You don't know what you'll find until you step outside. Estelle used to call these restless days, when the warmer-blooded gods began to stir and the cold ones began to settle, when dreamers were most prone to bad ideas and wanderers were likely to get lost. Addie has always been predisposed to both. End quote. The use of the word fickle there, of course, will be resonant after Estelle's epigraphic comments about the old gods, and we fold that back in with our description of the changing season, which situates those old gods, whatever they might be, very much in the natural world, of the natural world. And it is a natural world, as we see in the boundary between the warm and the cold, in the unsettled and destabilized firmament beneath our feet, in the ideas of dreamers and the paths of the lost wanderers. This isn't magic, at least not in the sense of the modern fantasy novel. It is the magic of the changing season, of the changing weather, of ideas. And this is important because it's resonant through the entire book. This is one of the ways in which Schwab moves away from magical realism or fantasy toward the fairy tale. This isn't a constructed world in the traditional sense, but rather a naively magical world, a world in which the uncynical eye finds the natural manifested in the seemingly supernatural, and to some extent vice versa. We see Addie stealing clothes from the boutique and note how ephemeral her possessions are, save for the leather jacket and the grey wooden ring, and what we're really given here, through the flow of recollection and connection, is a trail of breadcrumbs into the past, fragments of a story that will be recomposed non-linearly as we progress through the book, the meaning of the ring which she leaves behind, the meaning of the burning house in New Orleans, of the presence of the silken voice. We even playfully prompt the reader with the reference to Oscar Wilde's Dorian Gray, whose age is externalized from his body and cast artistically into the portrait. And already, we're led to odd contradictions in Addie's experience, an interesting differentiation between the intentional and the unintentional, that is, between the natural products and consequences of living in the world and acts of conscious creativity, because Addie leaves her clothes on the dressing room floor, and we note that they will be discovered later, after Addie has been forgotten, but they will be discovered, and there will be an implicit meaning to their presence there. There will be unanswered questions, an incomplete story in the mind of the boutique clerk, Addie had crumpled Toby's sheets, presumably, consumed his tea, inspired or orchestrated or requested the purchase of the Rilke book back in his apartment, all of which is to say that she doesn't move through the world without a trace, but without a conscious trace, leaving stray significance but never deliberate meaning. And that contrast is crucial. Suddenly, we're more than 300 years in the past, we're back in vion sur sartre still in the same present tense, but now sitting alongside her father, leaving her town for the first time. A quick digression here. It may be that vion sur sartre which is not real, is broadly based on the small town of Parsay sur sartre which is near Le Mans, though perhaps it's a little further away from the city than Addie's home is presented as. In that town, the 15th century French poet François Villon was, according to local folktales, imprisoned for a time, and Villon is a fascinating and influential early poet. He graduates from the University of Paris with his master's degree in 1452, is involved in some legal trouble and flees the city, and then in 1461 writes his most famous book, Le Testament. By 1463, he's in trouble with the law again and disappears from the pages of history, leaving only his work behind, work that has been translated into English multiple times over the centuries, including by pre-Raphaelite artist and poet Dante Gabriel Rossetti, who popularizes the translated line, Where are the snows of yesteryear? And also by American poet Galway Canal. Villon, though little is known of his life, was, like Addie LaRue, both an artist and a thief, and influenced innumerable pieces of art over the years, including the Threepenny Opera and Ursula Le Guin's story April in Paris and the works of Claude Debussy and many, many others, also very much like Addie. 
This digression, I should note, is my own speculation. This isn't based on anything Schwab has said or really any real clues in the text of the book, but I find the connection interesting enough to bring it up here. In any case, this is our introduction to Addie's home and the restless desire of the seven-year-old girl to go and see the world. Addie's home, as it's presented, feels rather like the fictional villages that serve as homes and points of idealistic opposition for various Disney princesses. We can imagine Belle living here, right, before she goes off to the Beast's castle, but really, it's less of a place and more of a template, a schematic for Addie's internal life, for her positive and negative desires, for those virtues which she considers most important, and for the formulation of her worldview. And it's no coincidence that Addie's father tells her stories which begin with that traditional formulation, il était une fois, once upon a time. Fairy tales, again. And just as importantly, Addie already wishes that she could write these stories down, but she can't which foreshadows her inability to creatively express herself later, to create the superimposition of meaning on the meaningless later in her very long life. And this is the perfect opportunity, since we've slowed down to consider this moment, to observe again the technique that I mentioned earlier, wherein the narrative voice will pull back to encompass more time, to encompass a much wider perspective. Quote, Adeline wishes she could write them down. Later, her father will teach her letters. Her mother will have a fit when she finds out and accuse him of giving her another way to idle, waste the hours of the day, but Adeline will steal away into his workshop nonetheless, and he will let her sit and practice writing her own name in the fine dust that always seems to coat the workshop floor. But today, she can only listen. End quote. To move out and to move back in. It is cinematic. It is the signature move of this book, relocating our experience of time, our understanding of Addie's experience within a broader context, often to create dramatic irony, as we do here, preemptively echoing with Addie's writing of her name in the sawdust of the floor of her father's workshop, the attempt to write her name in the fogged mirror in Toby's apartment. We're also introduced here to the ring's provenance, and I guess that this is the other signature move of the book, presenting what we assume to be a beginning and an ending and only later backfilling a twist into the middle of the timeline to complicate the reader's understanding, or to twist, to append the reader's understanding. More on the ring later. We introduce Catholicism primarily superficially as something against which Isel can be presented, right? But more than that, as we see from Annie's connection of the habits of prayer to her father turning the bread loaves upright or her mother licking salt from her thumb, the church is in their small town, but God, as Addie apprehends things, is not. She highlights the difference between old and new, but there is also, developing within Addie, a genuine connection to her home. There are things from here and things which are not from here, and the value of things from here, if they are not greater, the value is at least deeper. And it's easy to overlook this in all of Addie's desire for a wild life of adventure. She doesn't reject Villon. She wants more in addition, back in chapter three, we get the sketch of the interaction with Isabel. Quote, when Adeline told the girl about her trip, Isabel had only shrugged and said, I like it here, as if you couldn't like one place and want to see another. End quote. But it's the other aspect of the church, of Catholicism. It's newness compared to the older world presented by Estelle, which is mirrored by changes to Addie's own life. Quote, but this year, her mother has decided that it isn't right for her to go to market. It isn't fitting, even though Adeline knows she can still fit on the wooden bench beside her father. End quote. This is a cute joke. This is a wry little turn, though it is, of course, also textured, because, of course, Addie doesn't just fit physically on the bench beside her father, but more profoundly. She suits it. It suits her. Adventure suits her. It is compatible with her nature. Shaken by her mother's refusal to allow her to go to Le Mans anymore, and in a broader sense, struggling under the burden of growing and unwanted maturity, a change she did not ask for, Addie goes to visit with Estelle, and we catch up with the epigraph at the beginning of the book. And it's important, I should emphasize, that we try to understand the theological or supernatural schematic that Estelle offers Addie here, or rather, more specifically, the sketchy scribble that Estelle offers in the absence of a comprehensive schematic. We've established that Addie's cultural context is Catholic. Estelle is the sole voice of counterculture here, and while her stories of old gods are vaguely evocative of a pre-Christian pantheistic tradition, they are carefully non-specific, and 
minor spoilers for the rest of the book, but that isn't going to change. We aren't going to get a theological foundation for what is happening. We aren't going to understand the dark power with which Addie makes her pact. Or rather, we are going to grow in our understanding of him as a character, but not as an aspect of an instantiation of a wider spiritual reality. This absence of detail is going to be most fully represented by our treatment of souls, the quality, power, value, and nature of the human soul are not going to be considered. They're not going to be explored. Rather, the soul is going to be used as a simple totem, as a currency of trade. Indeed, when Addy's old god appears to make a trade, he will explicitly equate souls and coins. And I say this not to criticize this book, quite the opposite, in fact, but rather to observe the philosophical mode in which the book operates. Despite what the figure in the dark will say later in this reading, he actually might as well be a genie of a particularly tricky sort. He might as well be a fairy or a wizard or some other kind of treacherous source of magical power. Except, I suppose, inasmuch as his role as an old god anchors us back into the natural, into the physical world, he is of this place. That's something to keep an eye on as we move forward. But in any case, the result of this casual borrowing of an indistinct and indeterminate kind of pre-Christian faith is another confirmation of the mode in which the story operates. It doesn't really matter where the big bad wolf comes from, only that he's here. What happens is more important than why it happens. This is fairy tale logic. Like nature itself, the gods are powerful and present, but generally unconcerned with human life, and fully half of them are more dangerous, more malevolent. Note Addie here pursuing Estelle back to her hut in an imitation of what will happen later. She knows that if Estelle slips from her presence that the conversation is over, but if she can continue the moment, then she will get what she wants. Then we repeat the epigraph in attributed dialogue, but look what happens as it concludes. In the epigraph, we get the graceful name and the date it is allowed to live with authority and resonance. Here, with no response at all from Addie in the present, we cut ahead two full days until Addie's father has returned. She offers her gift, the very best pencil her father has given her, and prays, but there is no answer. And again, jumping the timeline, we're told that she never goes to market again, which isn't quite true, though the circumstances will certainly be very different. In the next chapter, we see Addie create the image of her stranger, the wild romantic partner who will never possess her, but will accompany her in adventure. And there's poetry here to Addie lamenting that the world is growing smaller rather than larger, as in fear of the shrinking world, she diminishes it still further, retreating to her art and looking only to the edges of town. Quote, she is at odds with everything. She does not fit. An insult to her sex. A stubborn child in a woman's form. Her head bowed and her arms wrapped tight around her drawing pad as if it were a door. End quote. And if the emotions that are sketched here for us, pun not intended, are perhaps elemental, are perhaps a little blunt in their simplicity, well, this is the fairy tale. This is the melodrama. These are the emotions to which we must give voice. Their magnitude, their enormity cannot be denied, cannot be suppressed. As acutely as Addie feels these things, they are expressed in that same magnitude, that same overwhelming complexity. The repetition at the end of this very brief chapter is one of my favorite things in this week's reading, or at least sets the stage for one of my favorite things in this week's reading. Quote, a dreamer scorns her mother. A dreamer mourns her father. A dreamer mourns Estelle. I think this is exceptional. It is echoed later, right at the moment of Addie's flight from the wedding, when we are given, quote, her mother softens, approving. Her father stiffens, suspicious. Estelle's eyes narrow, knowing. End quote. The way that these three characters work in tandem, what we might think of as the feminine, the masculine, and the mystical, is absolutely fascinating. It's a structure we're going to continue to track as we move forward, and when it returns, it's going to be enormously powerful. So, having established Addie's willingness to pray to the old gods, and we shouldn't overlook the symbolism of her sacrificing the tools of her art, of her creativity, to the desire for a different future, we bounce back to New York in 2014 in order to get some more exposition and rule building. Addie can go without food, we are told, without drink, without heat, but she needs, in a more profound sense, art and stories and beauty. 
And if we need still further confirmation of the kind of story this is, let's consider the book she steals from the folding table of Fred, the unwilling bookseller who is reading his way through the works of Sue Grafton. After buying coffee and making her way to the park, she finally looks down, and it's Kinder und Hausmunchen, literally children and household tales, the fairy tales of the Brothers Grimm. Quote, but Addie knows too well now, knows that these stories are full of foolish humans doing foolish things, warning tales of gods and monsters and greedy mortals who want too much and then fail to understand what they've lost until the price is paid and it's too late to claim it back. End quote. There's a really interesting way of parsing the middle of that quote, by the way. Gods and monsters and greedy mortals who want too much is ambiguous in the absence of clarifying commas, perhaps deliberately. We might circle back around to that at the end of the book. Back in the past, Addie has slipped into adulthood and is now due to be married, but does not want this future, this fate. She makes an excuse to escape her parents and Estelle, giving the approving, suspicious, knowing quote that I just mentioned, and then runs into the forest, sacrificing the ring and praying even as night falls. The old god taunting her appears as her stranger, wearing the face that she's drawn so many times. Quote, she knows it is a trick, a shadow parading as a man, but the sight of him still robs her breath. The darkness looks down at his shape, seeing himself as if for the first time, and seems to approve. Ah, so the girl believes in something after all. End quote. What, we might wonder, is the thing in which Addie believes. She has demonstrated her belief, her desperation, her hope, by making offerings to the old gods, by praying, and, according to the earlier chapter, has arguably been rewarded in that she's avoided marriage up until this point. But here the figure in the darkness notes her belief only when regarding this body that she has imaginatively created. And so we might infer a singularism at the heart of this book, a recognition, an assertion perhaps, that the making of art is the investment of belief and that art and imagination and prayer are all in some sense the same thing. So is this darkness, who will one day have a name but does not yet, is this darkness a response to Addie's belief in the old gods, a belief in the stranger, a belief in the power of art? Is there a meaningful difference between those three? Addie lays out the things that she does not want and then accepts the old gods' description of her situation. Quote, you ask for time without limit. You want freedom without rule. You want to be untethered. You want to live exactly as you please. End quote. And then, along with the offer of her soul when she is done with it, and what we might presume is Addie's first kiss, pleasure and pain, softness and blood, the deal is struck. And when Addie awakes, she has been forgotten. We confront the reality of this, visiting with Addie's parents, actual and metaphorical parents, in the same order as the previous structures, first mother, then father, then Estelle. And again, we're acknowledging their roles in this narrative structure around Addie, feminine, masculine and mystical. When Addie looks at her mother, quote, she realizes then that fearsome look on her mother's face is not the anger of a mother scorned, but that of a woman scared, end quote. That is to say, uniquely and definitively feminine. Her father, by contrast, is all but silent and uses his unyielding physical strength to remove Addie from their home. Estelle, by treating Addie as a wayward spirit, rejects her from normality, from the world that she has known, and inadvertently and appropriately relocates her into the world of the supernatural. And this is the kind of thing that gains a special significance because we're considering the invisible life of Addie LaRue as a fairy tale, because there is an almost mythic significance to this, the third repetition of the rule of three itself. This is Goldilocks and the porridge and the chairs and the beds. This is Addie's mother and father and essentially, if not literally, grandmother, echoing that she is a dreamer, offering different perspectives on her choice to flee from the wedding, and now, ultimately, rejecting her. It has a traditional structure, and it's a structure that's echoing through the real historical France of this period, thanks to a man named Charles Perrault, who is basically the first person in Europe to collect these folk tales, to collect Cinderella and Puss in Boots and Blackbeard, and perhaps most importantly for Addie LaRue, Little Red Riding Hood. Perrault is the first person to collect and collate and to publish these folk tales, popularizing the fairy tale as a narrative form, and he does so in 1697, when Addie is six years old, the year before we accompany her and her father to Le Mans for the first time. 
In fact, Perrault dies in real life in 1703, just after Addie's 12th birthday, prior to the scene in which Addie's mother prevents her from going to Le Mans anymore. And perhaps we ought not to overlook the significance of that. We ought not to overlook the significance of Addie's Le Mans years as being coexistent with the work of Charles Perrault and the bringing to light of the fairy tale tradition. The volume by the Brothers Grimm that Addie has already stolen won't be published until almost a century later. So fairy tales begin here with Perrault and with Addie, and I have no idea if this is intentional on the part of Schwab, but in a very real sense it doesn't matter, because thanks to Perrault's influence, the concept of late 17th, early 18th century France is very closely tied to fairy tale aesthetics, right? This is the land of Beauty and the Beast. So our little Red Riding Hood has been disobedient, has strayed from the path, and much like Little Red Riding Hood, Addie's disobedience to convention is rooted in her femininity and, to some extent, in her sexuality over the conscious choice to seek her desire in the metaphorically significant deep, dark woods. Addie is pulled back into the present, and we see her pass the day a ghost in this world, casually lying and misleading, and we also, of course, get Addie's trip to the movie theater, the moment of suspension in which she is swept up in the story. Quote, a quiet heaviness fills her chest when the credits roll. For a while she was weightless, but now she returns to herself, sinking until her feet are back on the ground. End quote. And we already understand, I think, Addie's relationship with art, but now we see it as something more, a lifeline, a way of briefly losing the present in a world in which the present is all that she has. We get the visit to the alloway, the dive bar where Toby is performing, and we get a similar kind of transformative experience as we saw in the movie theater. Very similar, in fact, as we realize that what we just experienced was the practiced dream of a woman who has been down this road before too many times. And here we must take note. We must be cautious because the book just lied to us, right to our face. The intimacy and the immediacy of the present tense perspective should not be mistaken for authenticity. It should not be mistaken for truth. Dreams and memories and imagination can all be presented in the same way, as can lies. This will matter much later in a turn that is regarded as unfair by many readers of this book, but this is the book showing us what it is willing to do. From here, we go to James's apartment, in part to explore how it is that Addie lives in New York City. There's just some fun world building happening here. And in part to explore her sense of isolation and of loneliness, as well as continually, as we're being pulled, tugged away from the present by memory, continually trailing breadcrumbs to our understanding. We get the reference to the house in New Orleans that was theirs, plural, and the return of the wooden ring with all its loaded, if indistinct, significance. Back in 1714, Addie gets further confirmation of the workings of her condition as she's awoken by Isabel, who forgets her as soon as she is going for help and returns in fear. Again, here we get that fairy tale three beat of Isabel forgetting the first when she finds Addie sleeping, the second when she returns to find a stranger holding her baby, and the third when she finds Addie again on the riverbank after bathing, moving through the same responses that are indicative, we suppose, of who a person is at their core. The repeated ability that Addie demonstrates to affirm the authenticity of a response through unconscious repetition. We've already seen that with Toby, of course. By this time, we're becoming comfortable with the tone of the book, or I guess some readers might be frustrated by the novel's refusal to offer a modern-day fantasy schematic outline of the rules. Okay, Addie can't write or say her name, or make any kind of lasting mark, even marks without significance, like the spilled wine on James's couch, but the things that she steals somehow endure. The gruyere and the soap in James's apartment don't magically replenish themselves, do they? Could Addie then create symbolism and significance by selectively stealing? Could she steal books from a shelf in a pattern such that the missing volumes begin with the letters of her name? Somewhere, out in the night, someone is writing a post for Reddit. But the book's casual indifference to those edge cases isn't a failure. It's not a lapse. It's a different mode of interaction. It's the preservation of magic, of something that is simultaneously complex and very simple. Addie can't make a mark, and the meaning of mark is not going to be interrogated. This is a world of old gods and artists, not philosophers. This is a world of the heart, 
not the head. This is why it's important to seek to understand texts on their own terms, to meet them where they are, rather than complaining that a book isn't keeping a promise that it never made. Addy returns home and takes up the wooden bird from her father's workshop, and if we haven't already made the connection between the birds and the Murray piece described at the beginning of this part of the book, then we may well do so now, and if we don't do it now, we will do it in the very near future. Addy arrives at Le Mans, and luckily we don't have to spend too much time with her in her misery. That's the great benefit of being a reader, I suppose. But there are a few things to highlight in this chapter, not the least of which is another reference to Addy's family structure. Quote, my name is Adeline LaRue, she tells herself. My father taught me how to be a dreamer, and my mother taught me how to be a wife, and Estelle taught me how to speak to gods. End quote. Again, masculinity, femininity, mysticism. And the connection here between dreaming and masculinity, quirking the structure that we've seen before just a little, is really interesting. And it's mirrored, of course, in Toby and in James and in the men that we have met so far in the book and the men that we have not yet met in the book, the artists that Addie has inspired. This won't be comprehensive as we move forward, but we should study the ways in which creativity and artistry are gendered. Addie steals the bread, her intelligence undimmed, perhaps even sharpened by her new circumstances, and then internally claims the name Addie rather than the more formal Adeline. Waking alone in James's apartment, she folds the first part of the book in on itself by visiting the Metropolitan Museum of Art and Revenir, the carved statue of the wooden birds. Quote, a secret kept, a record made, the first mark she left upon the world long before she knew the truth, that ideas are so much wilder than memories that they long and look for ways of taking root. End quote. Note that we credit the idea itself with agency. The idea wants the root. It wants to persist. It wants to grow. And the idea of Addie, encapsulated at least in part by the story of Addie that she has been repeating to herself over the last couple of chapters in the past and in the present, the idea of Addie persists. It has influence and creates other ideas. The overlap between our notions of ideas and art and stories, similarly, is something to keep an eye on as we read the rest of the book. We return to Le Mans and the danger that the world poses to a solitary woman, let alone a woman who cannot rest upon the authority and safety borrowed from memory, and inspired by her own art, by the stories that she credits to her stranger, Addie sets out for Paris. And from there, we're all at once back in the present, visiting somewhere new, meeting someone new, experiencing something new. Henry, a young man who looks like Addie's stranger, and seems to remember her from one moment to the next. No spoilers, but we will have much, much more to say about Henry next week. And that is going to do it for the first part of our exploration of the invisible life of Addie LaRue. And though we have lots more to look forward to, and perhaps feel a little impatience that we haven't got to it yet, it's also time to turn our attention to the next book that we're going to cover here on the podcast. I have set up a poll over on the Patreon page for Next Word, the podcast network that produces both this show and also The Last Star in Hollywood, in which Elizabeth Ray and I critically discuss the filmography of Tom Cruise. That Patreon page is available at patreon.com slash next word. The link is in the show notes. And if you sign up to support Next Word, then you don't just get bonus episodes of Stars and Swords and The Last Star in Hollywood, though you do. You don't just get unscripted unedited extra podcasts where we talk about anything we want to talk about, including, coming very soon, a conversation about our favorite TV show musical episodes. But you also get to vote on the next book that we will cover right here on Stars and Swords. And this time, I've been thinking a lot about the development of fantasy after Professor Tolkien. That is, fantasy authors who came of age between the publication of The Return of the King in 1955 and the posthumous publication of The Silmarillion in 1977, and are obviously influenced by Tolkien's work. So I've put together a short list of four great books, and you can choose which one we discuss next. We'll do these chronologically, so the first is Terry Brooks' The Sword of Shannara from 1977, which is, let's say, very powerfully and directly influenced by Tolkien. And while it is easy to see the echoes of Tolkien in this story of a humble hero accompanied by a great wizard undertaking a quest to destroy a great evil, I think Brooks does a lot of subtle and interesting things to reorient the reader in how we engage with fantasy fiction, what the intent of fantasy fiction is. It is an interesting example of a very directly influenced piece of world building. 
The second option is a very different direction, though like Sword of Shannara, it, it uses some science fiction ideas to get to the fantasy heart of the story. The second book is Julian May's The Many Colored Land from 1981, the first book in the saga of the Pliocene exile. In this book, people who do not fit in with the peaceful, harmonious future world of Earth in the early 22nd century travel through a time portal in France into the unimaginable past, millions of years into the past, and spoilers, they find their space elves who have colonized Earth. It is a very rich, very deep, and sometimes challenging book. There are themes of exploitation and sexual violence, and though the book is written by a woman, it was also written in the very early 1980s, so not all of the ideas surrounding sexual violence are what we would necessarily want them to be now. But as an exploration of our deepest myths and a way of pushing archetypal characters into conflict, it is a fascinating read, highly recommended. From there, we'll skip to the third book. In 1986, the publication of Daggerspell by Catherine Kerr, the first book of the Devery cycle, which is a strikingly original Celtic fantasy, which enfolds Scottish and Irish and Welsh influences into a world populated by humans and elves and the wee folk and a story that spans lifetimes as a selfish magician atones for a terrible mistake and a young woman comes to understand that her life is her own. I think that it is a fascinating book. I think that Kerr is a great writer. And though it comes with some of the same content warnings for sexual violence, it does not have the same intensity to those warnings as The Many Colored Land. Lastly, in perhaps the most predictable choice for a book in this category, we have 1990's The Eye of the World by Robert Jordan, the first book in The Wheel of Time. This is an epic undertaking in the art of world building. This is so much world building, in fact, that there is perhaps less plot in this novel than you might expect. But it's an excellent depiction of a developed fantasy world as heroes from a small, unexceptional town are forced into this wider world and thousands of years of backstory and struggle to keep their feet. The Wheel of Time series is incredibly influential and comes at a real turning point in the history of fantasy as a genre. In, in fact, it might be argued forces a real turning point in the history of fantasy as a genre. So The Sword of Shannara, The Many Colored Land, Dagger Spell, and The Eye of the World, two very long and very traditional and to some extent very masculine fantasy novels by giants of the genre, and two much more unusual reimaginings of the tropes of Western fantasy. You can cast your vote at patreon.com slash next word. And if you sign up to the Patreon, you can also come hang out on the Discord and argue for your favorite book with the listeners of Stars and Swords and with me. And that's it. That's the show for this week. I will be back next Sunday with part two of the book and possibly a revised schedule for the rest of the series. And in the meantime, please don't hesitate to get in touch if you have thoughts comments or questions and if you feel so inclined please leave a rating a review on your podcast app of choice i would really appreciate it until then no matter how desperate or dire never pray to the gods that answer after dark thanks for listening i'll see you next week mm -hmm.